Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, Senate leaders in energy and public safety weigh in on some of the key provisions in their respective budget plans for the next two years. Governor Walls celebrates the ECO Act and DFL lawmakers decry misinformation about COVID-19. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Continuing to develop affordable and clean renewable energy and to provide a qualified workforce to handle the energy needs of the future are just some of the hoped for outcomes sought in the energy portion of the Commerce and Energy Biennial Budget. Joining me in the studio to talk more about Minnesota's energy future is the chair of the Senate Energy and Utilities Committee, Senator David Senjum. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much. I was happy to be here. And, uh, I think it's the first time at the table as an energy chair. Maybe not, but... Uh, yes, it is, absolutely. Is that right? Yes. All those years in capital investment, yes. So Minnesota has successfully moved the needle away from fossil fuels in many areas, but two of every three homes still rely on natural gas. Natural gas is a cleaner fossil fuel, and yet it is still a fossil fuel. This year, the legislature passed some key legislation to address Minnesota's dependence through the Natural Gas Innovation Act. How will this new law help Minnesota move away from its dependence on natural gas? Well, uh, Shannon, uh, it, it will over a long period of time, obviously. But the, so much emphasis has been put on power plants, utilities, emissions, and cars, and so on and so forth. And that's probably been discussed at this table. But, uh, but not so much in the area of uh, how we heat our homes or natural gas, how we cook our meals, et cetera, dry our clothes. And, 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 and you know, that's a fossil fuel as well. And so. Uh, Center Point Energy came to us early in the session last year, and uh, and they're seeing the future with respect to natural gas. So we're not going to shut off natural gas anytime soon, for sure. But they also realize that uh, they have to do something with respect to how, you know, again, how we cook, how we heat, how we dry our clothes relative to natural gas. So so they, they have we have the innovative uh, natural gas act, and the, that purports to look at well, how can we, you know does it all have to be fossil fuel? Can we can we obtain it through anaerobic digestion, man manure, et cetera, other organic materials, and or can we use hydrogen, which is probably the fuel of the future in our, in our heating systems. Uh, and that's not to say we're gonna have hydrogen in our, in our you know, heating our, our, our dryers or our, our stoves or our furnaces immediately. But uh, what, the way it's happening in this world is they're interjecting a little bit at the time and and uh, you know maybe it's five percent, maybe it's ten percent, and so on. But incrementally, all that does is overall lessen emissions. And so th there's a future there. It's a long one. But uh, again, Centerpoint Energy and a few other energy companies across the country are realizing that and believe that they need to get into some pilot programs to start exploring this further. That's what this act is all and about. And so this allows places like Centerpoint Energy to begin that process. To, right. It incentivizes them to continue to look yeah. for geothermal, sure. I think I read, and Geo other ways right, exactly. of, of creating power for our homes, businesses, things like e that. Exactly. And that's the, the, and, and the, again, they, they understand that over time there'll be enough public pressure on those emissions, because there's a lot of them. Just <laughs> you know, look look at the houses in the wintertime, and you can see the you know you can see the smokestacks, mm -hmm. so to speak, or the chimneys, and uh, and that's you know that's not smoke, that's that's just water vapor. But nonetheless, our homes use a lot of fossil fuel to keep them warm. Yes, they do. Um, there is money in this bill, two and a half million dollars, to promote jobs of the future by initiating a pilot program to train workers for clean energy careers. What do you hope pilot projects like this will achieve? Uh, so this is a pilot project specific in North Minneapolis. It's, it's, it's to some degree an equity project. Uh, but what we hope it's going to achieve is, you know, further individuals that uh, are frankly now in the center of the city and, 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 and get them involved in, in renewable energy and renewable energy education and ultimately work uh, at, uh, at certain levels. Uh, we do, again, teach some of this certainly in our community technical colleges, but this is a unique little uh, uh, college or training place, training center in North Minneapolis that's going to somewhat do the same and prepare them then to get further certification within our community colleges. So we think that's important. We think that we need more diversity, more equity in, our, in, the, in, the, in the staff, the field staff that 
puts up wind, solar, et cetera, et cetera. This will help. Speaking of education, um, in the coming months, new installations of solar panels may begin to appear on school buildings. And that activity of solar panels on school buildings may even make it into curriculum, teaching kids about renewable energy. This is the Solar on Schools grants. What more can you tell me about this? Well, it's uh, something that we've done, just touched into, but we're getting into a little bit stronger now. $8 million, actually $16 million statewide. And uh, that's to assist schools in a couple of ways, certainly from the standpoint of, of uh, educating the kids, uh, but also from the standpoint of, uh, if you will, holding down energy costs within schools. It, you can, it, it, they can do this in a fairly significant way. Uh, but again, the, the kids will learn. Uh, it's, a, it's a training tool, it's a teaching tool. Actually, this year, uh, in this particular bill, we added one little uh, inclusion there, and that's that uh, in going into any, any of these school buildings that have it, there will be a little meter on the wall it will tell you what the solar panels are generating and what they have generated over the course of, say, the past year. So, uh, again, uh, it will be there for the public to look at and be curious about and things like that. So, it, again, just to further expose, uh, again, uh, our students to uh, the future of energy, and that's uh, solar is part of that. And speaking of solar, um, there's $5 million per year for the next two years that will go to XL Energy for their solar rewards program so homeowners can get some help incorporating solar power into their homes. And I, ha I have to admit, I've looked at solar panels. It has seemed cost prohibi prohibitive yeah. to me. But I wonder how important are efforts like this to get you know your average person like me to take that next step? Well, you know, it's an enticement. It, it, it's a couple thousand dollars, and that, that may kind of swing the deal for you and uh, or anyone else. And so, yeah, we think it we think it's important. Uh, we you know, want to see, you know, more personally powered, if you will, uh, generation off people's houses. And, uh, and to the extent we can have that, uh, we'll have to produce less in larger facilities. So it, 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 it all adds up over time. This is a long-term you know, process, so to speak, but uh, we're just sort of trying to decentralize energy. But also, uh, uh, again, this homegrown energy, so to speak, is, uh, is part of the totality of what we need to go forward. Um, back to the jobs and and you know citizens towns you know some some places in Minnesota get a lot of their tax base from the power plants that exist where they are um, some of those power plants are going to shut down so the Department of Employment and Economic Development or DEED has developed a grant program for uh, communities that have lost or will lose their coal-fired nuclear energy or natural gas facilities um, run by public utilities. I think Becker may be a city that is confronting this issue. What do communi communities facing these kinds of changes need to know about this program? Well, it, they need to know that it's, it's, it's vitally important and vitally important to the state. Uh, uh, I, I would say, and people don't realize this, and it don't became, I became aware of it maybe just a couple of years ago, uh, by about 2035, which is, you know, all in, uh, 15 years or so, maybe 14, uh, there will not be a power plant, maybe with the exception of the Monticello nuclear power plant, running in Minnesota that's, that's producing energy today, on, on, on a hot Minnesota day. Uh, and so we have a lot of work to do in terms of, uh, of catching up. And, and these plants, uh, along with them, as they do uh, finish their, their life cycle, so to speak, uh, have a lot of employees and, uh, and a lot of tax base associated with that. Tremendous effects, whether it's Oak Park Heights or Red Wing or, or Monticello or, or, or anywhere else uh, that, that has a major power plant. These, these people are uh, going to be affected. These communities are going to be affected. So how do we now, uh, 14 years earlier, uh, begin to uh, uh, kind of face this problem with, the, with these communities and try to keep them as whole as possible and, and let them move into a different kind of future? So that's what this is all about. It's important, uh, and uh, we we the other thing we did do here is a different bill. But uh, uh, as these utilities close down, there's also a, a bill, Senator Matthews' bill, that has to do with the, these employees, you know, benefits. You know, how do we tra retrain them? How do they keep their pensions or, or you know keep keep what they have alive that uh, through no reason of their own uh, is going away uh, simply because of changing times. Finally, before we go, there was a ceremonial bill signing this week by Governor Walls for the ECO Act. Now, Senator Jason Merrick is the one who carried this legislation, but when it was passing on the Senate floor, you called it landmark. Um, it's also being touted as an example of democracy at work. 
Can I have your final thoughts on the Eco Act of 2021? Yeah, it's a, it, well, it's, it's a great bill, I uh, understand that, but, but we talk so much about new generation and all this stuff, uh, but this is about conservation. Uh, the kilowatts you don't have to produce is the, the cheapest kilowatts you can have, and so we're talking here about new ways to conserve energy and, and enticements for utilities to, to use to, in fact, cause us to use less energy. And, uh, whether it's different kinds of, whether it's a heat pump or whatever, whatever it might be, uh, some entitements, some re rebates, uh, not unlike the, the little light bulbs the utilities company used to give off, but uh, give away rather, but mm -hmm. <laughs> they've given them all away. And so there's no more, there's no more way to save energy here. This, this will take us to a different step. So it's a good thing. Senator David Senjum, always a pleasure. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much, Anna. This week, Governor Walls held a ceremonial bill signing to highlight the importance of the recently enacted Energy Conservation and Optimization Act of 2021. You have folks here who are climate activists, if you will. You have folks here who actually run the wires that move our electricity down the line. You've got folks here who are the utilities, the municipal utilities, the rural electrics, um, some of our larger energy producers who actually have to deliver the power to our houses. And what consumers always want, they want to see us reduce carbon emissions, but they also want to make sure they can pay their bill and they want to make sure when they turn on the lights, the lights come on. These are the folks that make all of those things happen. But what I'm really proud of is there's two folks that weren't able to be here, but I, I'm going to name it because they were instrumental in getting this through. Senators Rarick and Senjum were able to help us move this thing through. And in a time when we become really uh, just numb to the fact that everything is fiercely partisan, this issue of job creation, saving Minnesotans money and reducing carbon emissions is a unified effort from some folks. So I think this is a really big breakthrough. We know from our experience at the department operating the conservation improvement program as it existed before the ECO Act, that for every $1 invested in energy conservation, Minnesotans get $3.75 in return. These benefits come back to Minnesotans in the form of lower bills, good jobs in engineering, HVAC technicians, designers, construction workers. And we also know that when we have improvements for one home or one business, it can save a homeowner or business money, but it also reduces our overall energy demands. I think we have vivid displays right now. Uh, this summer, one of the hottest and driest summers uh, of my life following uh, extreme weather events all year round, the polar vortex uh, in the spring, of how important it is to give consumers the ability to conserve energy, both to save their pocketbook and also to save the planet, frankly. Um, we heard uh, in the committee this year that the existing program, the Conservation Improvement Program, just over the four days of the extreme weather polar vortex event that was down in Oklahoma and Texas, just over those four days, uh, saved over $20 million to Minnesota consumers. Uh, this bill, which makes the program so much larger, is going to save so much money for consumers. It's going to create jobs. It's going to uh, also uh, help save the planet. For electrical workers and building trades workers, uh, this is simply just about jobs. Uh, but not only that it saves you know, us money on our electric bill, it also puts us to work. Through SIP and the ECO Act, uh, creates jobs, local jobs, through efficiency, electrical efficiency, heating and cooling ventilation, uh, in insulation, installation. Projects across the state will help put our members to work. These projects are typically designed and carried out by our local businesses and installed by licensed state contractors using locally sourced products and local workers. And late last week, DFL lawmakers called a press conference to urge their Republican colleagues to help end the spread of misinformation about the COVID-19 vaccines. This is from the Surgeon General of the United States, and in, hit, in this report he says, health misinformation is a serious threat to public health. It can cause confusion, sow mistrust, harm people's health, and undermine public health. From my perspective, through the course of this pandemic, we have been dealing with a virus that we didn't necessarily understand and two dueling narratives about the risk of the virus to the people's health. And so today we are gathered together to raise this issue and to call on our GOP colleagues across the state of Minnesota to end the spread of misinformation and to use their powerful platforms to continue to encourage vaccination because vaccination is the best and quickest route
to end the spread of the Delta virus that is now emerging as the predominant virus in Minnesota, as well as across the country. These vaccines have been clinically vetted extensively and trialed, as well as vetted by regulatory agencies like the FDA. Thousands of Americans thankfully have taken their vaccine and this has been incredibly effective, not only at stopping the spread and infectivity of COVID, but decreasing serious illnesses and thankfully and most importantly, decreasing the rate of death from COVID. If you've had COVID before, it's important, just like anyone else who has not gotten COVID, to be vaccinated. The vaccine is more effective at stopping reinfection than your previous viral history. I bring this up today because it's incredibly important in light of the Delta variant. The Delta variant is a new variant in the United States that we've seen rise exponentially, both here in Minnesota and across the United States. The challenge with Delta variant is it causes you to be more sick, and it's incredibly more contagious. You know, I come in today as a parent of a little one who is not yet eligible to take the vaccine. So I am deeply impacted um, by all those folks that we've lost already, but also I am deeply concerned about those folks that we can protect, and we're not doing it yet. I'm calling our GOP colleagues to make sure and to ensure that you get the facts and the truth about the vaccines out to your constituents. In one of the most hard fought and controversial budget areas, the legislature ultimately provided $2.64 billion over the next two years to fund the Department of Public Safety, the Department of Corrections, and the court system. I spoke with the chair of the Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee, Warren Limmer, about a few aspects of the new law. As with many of the omnibus budget bills, there is so much to cover in this one. I'd like to begin by talking about women and children because there are a number of new policies and changes that will impact the lives of women and children. Can you describe just a few of them? Thanks, Shannon, for having me. Uh, this last year was really uh, complex, difficult, and uh, we still were under, under the disguise of uh, COVID. So we were doing all of our meetings, complicated meetings through a Zoom process which is very difficult. Uh, but uh, moving on, we, we did have a focus uh, on women and children and how they get involved in the criminal justice system. I think the most notable one was a, a project that we started last year. And that was the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women uh, Task Force. And we authorized that task force for about a year and a half. And as a result, uh, we came up with a number of recommendations. These are claims that there were uh, women and children, notably from Native American communities, that over many, many years have been ignored in their claim that, that these women were either murdered or they mysteriously became missing along with their children. We've talked with law enforcement uh, up in those areas and law enforcement doesn't really have a clear idea of what they're talking about. So as a result of the task force, there seems to be enough smoke to think there's fire there. So what we did is we extended the task force into an office, an official office uh, to continue studying this issue. We also expanded it into another task force, murdered and missing African-American women that were in the same category. And so we, want to, we don't want to ignore anyone if there has been a victim, a missing person, or tragically a murdered person that has not met uh, a standard of justice. We want to make sure that we ignore no one and pursue that. We also increased um, uh, intervention programs, youth intervention programs, getting kids off of streets, getting them into projects through the summer, uh, during the school year. Also, we also recognize that when kids do get involved in juvenile justice issues, they're eventually gonna to go to a juvenile court. 
for some reason, um, it's been a pattern in the court system to bring the defendant child into a courtroom shackled with handcuffs, oftentimes with ankle bracelets, bring them in and then unlock those chains in front of the judge, in front of uh, any, other, any other person that might be in the courtroom. And uh, we were convinced that there's enough trauma on a young person that they don't necessarily need that. You've got a big system, you've got a court system, you have bailiffs there uh, for security. In the event that a court or a judge thinks that that person is a real threat, they can continue with the shackling. But the default is going to be, no child is going to have shackles on when they go in front of a courtroom. So uh, I think that's going to be a positive case. We also started one in uh, corrections, uh, Senator Kiffmeyer brought forward a proposal uh, regarding uh, a Healthy Start Act. And that's for women who are already convicted, they're in a prison setting, but they might be pregnant, they might be uh, postpartum. Uh, we're gonna allow that particular person to keep their child in the system or they could temporarily leave if they're not a violent threat for a short period of time, maybe even up to a year so they can create that bonding with that child. And at the same time, um, kind of subconsciously, they're going to learn that there's other priorities in their life other than just themselves and criminal behavior. And uh, we're hoping that that will reduce recidivism with women inmates. I'd like to turn, if, if, you, if you don't mind, I'd like to turn to another topic. Uh, and it's the one that everyone was talking about all session long, and it was the one that you've said yourself was the most challenging, and that is threading that needle with police reform. The Republican-led Senate said no reforms could undermine law enforcement, and the DFL House wanted to ensure that deaths like those of George Floyd and Dante Wright would never happen again. So yeah. what was passed that met the balance of those two sides, if you will? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. You know, we, uh, we approached it in a balanced approach. Uh, we knew that there was claims for reform in policing in Minnesota. It was really highlighted by last year's death of George Floyd. And we did immediately meet, we did have reform bills passed in the middle of a special session, a mere 10 to 14 days after that tragic occurrence uh, happened. But we continued that discussion this year. Uh, however, we wanted to approach it in a balanced way. The other side was focusing on all total reform. And we began to realize, yes, reform in some areas were needed, but at the same time, we were experiencing, uh, and we still are, uh, record-breaking violent crime in the Twin Cities, and it's expanding into the suburbs. And these are not only violent crimes, these are shootings, these are, these are gunshots of um, street gangs that don't hit their target, but they've been hitting kids. A uh, little girl was shot right off a trampoline and died. Uh, another little girl, two years old, was eating ice cream cone in the back seat of her car. She she was the target, uh, inadvertent target of a of a bullet that uh, killed her. And we began to realize we need a balanced approach. We're going to recognize reform, and this is what we did. Uh, we we came forward first with the law enforcement. We. Uh, we continued with forensic science, drug analysts because of the drug increase in the state of Minnesota. We expanded violent crime enforcement teams to go after drugs, as well as the crime on light rail uh, in the metropolitan area. We removed that voluntary intoxication defense for rape. You might recall that uh, if, if someone was, uh, was out drinking, and they became drunk, they could, and if they were a victim of a rape right after that, we recognized that cannot be used as a defense for a rapist. So we removed that out of our state law. We increased penalties for sex traffickers, created a new law on child torture. Uh, the Matson Strong Bill was uh, stiff, stiffer penalties for those who are wanting to attempt to kill a police officer. 
and it went on and on. However, our reform measure uh, that we balanced with this was we secured more training for police officers, $6 million per year, uh, and we named it after Flando Castile. It was a reminder to law enforcement that there are victims that um, have no real explanation of why they were shot and killed. Uh, despite the fact that that police officer was exonerated, it still leaves in the community. Um, uh, well, I guess I call it a heart issue. They're concerned about it and that they see it as an example of police uh, abuse. We increased, increased body cameras for law enforcement officers, for state law enforcement, BCA, corrections, DNR, uh, we created a response for inmate incarceration in county jails called the uh, Hardell Sherrill Act. That's an individual who was neglected and he eventually died at the uh, hands of neglect by a correction officer. Uh, we modified uh, post board requirements. We included uh, databases on police misconduct. So we have a running total. If there is a, a police officer who has a continuous issue with that, we codified no-knock warrant limitations that you just simply can't uh, go forward and um, take a, a, have a no-knock warrant issued without or under the circumstances of just a simple possession. It would have to be a sizable amount. Senator Limmer, I hate to interrupt you, but we are close to out of time. And I want to get one more, one more comment from you. At the end of session, you said that you hope to take the Judiciary Committee on the road during the interim to talk to people around the state about various topics. What do you want to investigate further? I think the, uh, the one issue that remains unanswered and it continues to fester uh, between people groups is uh, a racial um, relationship between um, people of color and law enforcement and other figures of authority with government. I don't think there's uh, necessarily an issue, a pronounced issue between separate people groups, but I think it all pivots off of government and how we respond. Are we, are we responding in the correct way? Are we recognizing cultural differences? There's an anger there that, and a hurt that I think is crying for a sense of justice. And we need to analyze it before we make judgment on it. Uh, I think it's important to realize that type of thing. I'm gonna personally go out and search it out first, and then hopefully I can get the committee to focus on some of that as well. Senator Limmer, there's so much in this bill. I wanna thank you for just getting the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I'm sorry to be so wordy, but it was a big bill. It was a big bill, thank you so much. Thank you. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.